Hey, welcome to The Perspective today. I'm Mike Sherbin, and we're continuing on in our study in the scriptures today on listening for God's voice. So how do you listen for God's voice in the midst of difficult times? Before we get there and before I tell you what our guest is going to be discussing with us today, have you ever noticed that many times when we encounter a difficult or a painful subject, we use a little bit of humor just to help ease the tension if we can use that expression? And uh, that's a little bit about what we're talking about today. And it's like the little question that goes out, somewhat of a joke. What are the two things you can always count on in life? And one is death and the other are taxes. It was George Bernard Shaw who actually said that the statistics on death are quite impressive. One out of one people always dies. And as we process that, maybe death has hit you close to home. I think of just what I heard walking into the studio in between breaks, how a good friend of mine, his mother, just passed away. Think of what happened to me uh, a week ago as I was planning a little bit of vacation and then suddenly a close friend of mine passed away. And as we use that phrase, even to pass away, what we really mean is that they died. And the statistics are absolutely correct. One out of one dies. How do we handle that? How do we handle our grief? And how do we even begin to process all the different thoughts that we have? Well, him with me today is uh, Cam Taylor. And Cam was with us uh, a couple months ago. Uh, he is the author of a, a new book called Unlocking the Mystery of Grief. And I just want to welcome Cam back to us all the way from the West Coast. And some would call it the best coast, but uh, you know what? I beg to differ. But Cam, glad you're with us today. Thanks for being on The Perspective. Great to be here, and thanks for having me back. Yeah, so just before we uh, talked the last time, you were about to get married. So I think congratulations are in order. Tell us that you've gotten married. You tied a good knot. Yes, I got married May the 5th, and the knot is security tied. Thank you. <laughs> okay, and you're now married a couple months, so... Um, you could probably write a book on being married for less than three months, right? It'd be a bestseller. That's right. <laughs> Cam, Give me some time for that one. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're smiling because over the last 10 or more years, many times the smile has been taken off your face and God's allowed you to come back. Uh, you've written so much on resilience. Well, help us to revisit your story with you. Give us a couple of the highlights of some of the significant losses that you've encountered. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I would say there's two very significant events that were very much losses for me. The first first one that really hit me hard was in 2011 when I had a serious motorcycle accident with my wife at the time, Vicky. And it was so serious that I almost died, but I was able to go to the hospital, airlifted to the hospital, and they kept me alive. But it also took me on this journey of inserts over about a three-year period because of this bad infection that I got in my leg. And what I learned from that was the just the difficulty of having a traumatic event like that. It's very much a loss of so many things, of mobility, and I couldn't work, and, and the list went on. So I learned a great deal. The second loss of, I would say, even greater significance was when my wife developed, we found out she had kidney cancer right at the beginning of covid April 2020, and she passed away on May 14th, just six weeks after we had wow. the diagnosis. So that loss hit me like a freight train. And both of those, I've learned so much and I've been able to, I'd, I'd say, spend significant time learning, growing, grieving, and just learning a lot about myself and about many other things. That's a, that's a lot to even process in a, as you encapsulated it. Uh, so succinctly. But out of what you have gone through yourself and, and what you have written, uh, I got a, some questions that I think that are going to be helpful for our viewers today because we all grieve at different times. And in, I haven't lost a spouse, thankfully, but you know, a week ago I lost a very close friend. And I don't even believe that I've begun to unpack all my feelings because I, I officiated his funeral. And you're yep. with his kids trying to help them to walk through the loss of, of their dad and, and then their mom who had passed away six months earlier. So there was a lot of loss. So maybe talk to me, but talk to our people in general. 
What would you say to the person whose grief is new? What do they do? What are some healthy things to uh, at least embark upon? There's a lot that could be said, but I find that more needs to be done than said when somebody is fresh in their grief. And the way that I practice this on a regular basis is I do lead a grief group at my local hospice with people that are fresh in their grief. So I'm, I do this frequently. And what I start out doing is just allowing people to tell their stories. That's one of the, the validation of grief is so important stay on the front end. A lot of times people don't have their grief validated oh. because perhaps their family members have grown tired of hearing the story or they're uncomfortable with that. So it's having it validated by empathetic people is of the utmost importance early on. And another key important element is to say that you are not different because you're feeling any number of feelings or having certain thoughts. There are so many different thoughts and feelings that hit the grieving person that I find it so important both to validate and to say, you're not crazy. There are other people that are experiencing the exact same thing as you. You're not alone. I care for you. I'm here for you. And I want you to know that your grief is your grief. And I want to support you in that. So those are a couple thoughts that come to mind. Yeah, no, that's very helpful. Uh, here's a question. What surprised you the most? about your own journey uh, in grief? One thing that hit me very hard was, in spite of all that I'd learned about resiliency and overcoming difficulties, I had no idea what I was doing. And I think that surprised me. Because this, this loss of my wife was so different from the other losses I'd had, I really felt like, I had no idea what I was doing. So this, this element, and I think what I've, in hindsight, I realize you're just in a fog when you lose somebody close to you. you. You're not thinking straight. There's all these things that are going on. And on top of that, I felt like I was a child trying to ride a bike and I had no idea how to do it. That surprised me. Very interesting. Um, how important are grief groups uh, many times we, we try to remain insular. You know, I can do it on my own. And can you speak into that? Did you go to a grief group yourself after your wife passed away? Or did was there a way that you could find people who would listen to your story? Well, I I now believe in grief groups. But it's interesting because when I was early on in my grief, I didn't believe in grief groups. And I didn't think I needed them. And I think part of why I didn't feel I needed them is that I had such a great support system through my church, through my family. I was, I was reading books. I was learning all about grief. Plus, I was processing my grief, partly because of what I learned in the past about being honest and open and, and just talking about it and telling my story. So I think in my case, it wasn't as important to have a grief group early on because I was creating people. There were people in my life that I was actually processing my grief with. But what I'm realizing now is that there's a lot of people that aren't like that. Yeah, They don't know. They don't have the support. They don't know where to go. They're not reading the books. They don't have the ideas that help them to grieve well, nor the people that will listen. So now that I'm leading grief to group, believe in them because I just think there are so many people that are isolated. They don't have the support. And of hearing these stories over and over again, nobody wants to hear my story. I don't know what I'm doing. I need these ideas. I need this support. So yes, I believe in grief groups. And I think that, no, they're not necessarily for everybody. But somewhere you need to find a place where you can go and learn. There's the the ideas that are needed and the support that's needed. You put those two together, and that's two of the three legs that are required yeah. for a healthy, thorough grief journey. The third one is the passage of time. There's no getting around it. It's going to take time, but I think grief groups, having that support really helps that process and helps keep you to keep you moving. Very interesting. Just before we go to the break, uh, is there different kinds of grief that people experience, like in different levels? Like your wife died of cancer. 
Uh, what about the person who is looking at a, a loved one who has committed suicide or taken their life? Or what about someone who is killed, uh, you know, whether in a shooting or by a drunk driver? Do we process those kinds of grief differently? There's things that we need to be aware of. I do think not all grief, grief is not equal by any means. And I think it's, it's very different for different people. The interesting thing is you can have two very similar losses that are handled completely differently by two different people. Now, and I, in the grief groups that I lead, I have a wide range of people. I, I have people that have lost adult children to suicide. I have people that have lost children because of the fentanyl overdose and just devastating losses. I also have people that have lost a loved one or lost a grandparent. And it's interesting that there is no, there is no commonality between how those people handle those losses necessarily. They're all unique. They're all different. But one person who is very resilient can handle it very differently and and it seemingly in a healthy way versus someone else whose loss is more minor be devastated and end up getting stuck. So I think that's an interesting question that I don't think has a real clear answer to. Well, we're going to come back and talk more with Cam Taylor in a moment. He's the author of Unlocking the Mystery of Grief. And if you'd like to talk to somebody right now, why not call our toll-free number? It's available 24-7, 855-910-6297. There are people there who want to chat with you, to pray with you and encourage you. We're going to be right back in just a moment with Cam Taylor. Welcome back to The Perspective. Mike Sherbino here with uh, Cam Taylor, who is in British Columbia, the author of uh, a new book called Unlocking the Mystery of Grief. And we want to make this available to the first 10 people who write to me, write prayer at theperspective.tv. Cam's holding it up. I haven't even got my copy yet. And we're going to send you uh, through uh, one of the distributors. We'll send you a copy of this book if you're dealing with the subject of grief. So write to me today, prayer at the perspective.tv. Um, Cam, when did you decide to write the book? How soon after your wife's passing, or was it just a natural culmination of life? The event that really set me in the direction of writing the book was later on that year, 2020, I was doing some journaling. It was a significant birthday for me. And I was drinking my free Starbucks drink, just processing my grief. This was a few months later. And I felt this strong inclination calling whisper in my, in my mind, in my heart that I was to be a grief mentor. People had been saying that to me, that even though I wasn't trying to, you know, my pastor and my friends were saying, you're mentoring us as you grieve. And I didn't, I wasn't trying to. But I realized I let that sink in and then I took that really that calling to be a grief mentor and just started eventually, it took a few more months before I started writing, but I started a grief group early that next year, just because I felt this calling, this urge that I wanted to help people. That was, I had learned too much to hold it to myself. I really wanted to come alongside other people. And so the writing just evolved. I created a video series. I've been blogging this topic for several months. And that is where the book came from, is me helping people and learning and then putting that into this framework of a book. Very interesting. You know, as you talked about being a mentor to people who uh, were grieving or had questions on grief, uh, we've often heard that there are several stages to grief, at least five stages. Do you agree with that? Uh, do they just, are they all linear? They, oh, this has happened first, then the next, the next. Or are they all mumble jumble? Talk to us about that and speak to our listeners who might be in one of those stages, whatever it may be. Well, it's very common for people to have heard of the five stages, the Kubler-Ross five stages. It is very interesting that even Kubler-Ross herself and those that have worked with her never meant for those stages to be linear, to be 
sequential, but that's unfortunately how they've been known as. And I would say that grief does not align with those five stages, that grief is so much larger than that. And some people don't even experience some of those stages. So if people are led to believe that it has to happen this way, then they'll often be dis disillusioned and disappointed because it isn't how grief works. And I, and there's tons of research that really supports this idea that grief is different for everybody. I would say there's common elements that are important when you're grieving, but it doesn't happen sequentially. There is no linear process, but I believe there are some key ideas and that's sort of the way that I build my framework, which is not around a sequential order, but these are the key elements you need to grieve thoroughly. What was the area that you struggled with the most? And is there some waves that come back to hit you every once in a while still? I, what I realized definitely, it, this was two years after my wife died, is I realized that there was more work to be done below the surface. And, and there was another surprise that I realized that yes, I felt I had grieved well, but what sort of hit me was I wasn't quite ready to discover how to live again. I wasn't quite ready to move forward because there were still conversations. There was still support I needed. I needed to work through some of those issues from my past that I hadn't worked through. So I think what, I, what I'm realizing is that sometimes when you have a loss, all these layers of losses and traumas and hurts that have happened in your life can sometimes surface and you're more of a mess than you even realize. Okay, so take to us to so the So you point. need to continue. To me, it's this lifelong journey of exposing our lives and, find, and, and meeting God, having God meet us in those moments of the deeper work that he wants to do in our lives. I love you making that, that connection for us. Talk to me about grief and how it impacts our behavior with other individuals. Like, did you find with certain people you just suddenly wanted to open up or did it cause mood swings for you? Were you a recluse? Uh, go there for a few minutes and, uh, and help us to be aware of how it can hit us from that angle. Well, for me, it was, it hit me in, in multiple ways. I think one, and I, I find this, this is a recurring pattern for a lot of people. Our willingness to even say be in a crowd, and I, I enjoy crowds. I like interacting with people, but I'd go to a party or an event, and I would want to get out of there in about five minutes. And Interesting. I, I knew that was unusual, but yet I couldn't stand facing these conversations, and I wanted to kind of run for the door. So that was kind of one, one example. I think there's this brain fog that happens for a lot of people where you're not thinking straight. The other thing that I, and I write about this in my book, this idea that we don't know, we don't always appreciate sadness. I love that, that little, uh, the kids cartoon, uh, inside, inside out. And especially yep. in the first one where sadness is not valued early on in the movie, but all of a sudden sadness becomes this amazing part of who we are that needs to be brought out into the light when there's loss, when there's hurt. And that's exactly what I experienced is I learned that sadness needs a voice, needs space to literally overwhelm the person who's grieving because it actually serves you to slow everything down and to help with that processing. So there's just a few nuggets that come to mind. That's very helpful. Cam, you've written a book called Unlocking the Mystery of Grief. And uh, I just want to say to our viewers again today, that for the first 10 that write into us, we're going to send you a free copy of Cam's book. You can write to me, prayer at the perspective.tv, prayer at the perspective.tv. You can also share your prayer requests there as well. Uh, make sure you give us your address so we can mail you a copy of that book. And his book can be found at, uh, you know, bookstores, distributors, anywhere where you find your books. Cam, when people read Unlocking the Mystery of Grief, what are the key things they're going to discover? Well, I think they're going to discover someone understands what you're going through. I try to write in a style that's very authentic and 
and practical so that people can hear me in my stories and in my thoughts. Wow, he really understands some of what I'm going through. I think the other benefit or other gift that I want to give in this book is I want people to to believe and realize that you can go from this very deep grief through this journey to the point where you can actually learn to live again. So it's a very hopeful book. It's not a sequential pathway, but very practical tools. There's tons of exercises you can do. There's journal prompts. I'm a big journaler. I believe in that. So the book is a book to be worked through, a book to be used, not just read, but a book that will, I believe, change a person's life for the better as they apply these principles and these ideas and these practices to their lives. Well, I appreciate that synopsis for us. And Cam, we look forward to having you back on the program again in the future. Again, Cam Taylor, our guest today, uh, recently has written Unlocking the Mystery of Grief. Stay with us, folks. We're going to be right back in just a moment. Will you donate two hours of your time? Crossroads Prayer Center is seeking people with a heart willing to join in the amazing work God is doing through prayer. Providing over 1,300 prayer interactions daily, Crossroads Prayer Partners speak biblical truth and words of life over people's needs. Join in God's transforming work through prayer and enrich your faith. Learn more at crossroads.ca slash prayervolunteer. Hi, I'm Ryan Walter, and playing in the NHL, I was so fortunate to win a Stanley Cup ring. So thankful with the Montreal Canadiens in 1986. Now, Jenny and I, we had the ring in our home, and we lost the ring. Can you believe losing a Stanley Cup ring? Couldn't find it. We looked everywhere. We were scouring. Finally found it in the drawer of our our daughter, Christy. (laughs) She was young. She took the ring. It must have been sparkly, and and she put it in her drawer. Uh, Here's what I'd like to leave you with. So in Mark 10, it says, ask, and you shall receive. Seek and you'll find it. We were seeking a knock and the door will be opened. Three great ideas in our Christian walk. Ask, seek, and knock. Continuing on in our study this week of listening to God's voice, how do we hear his voice and how are we directed by him? I'm wondering if you're a little bit like me. I have to confess that I've become uh, overly dependent on my GPS. Sometimes even to get around town, areas that I should have committed to memory by now, I click on the GPS to make sure that I get to the right spot at the right time. It has become super convenient. Can I be overcommitted to that, overdependent upon it? Uh, probably. But what about in my relationship with God? Because what I'm talking about right now is that as you and I learn to live out the life that God intended us to live, He wants us to be overly, completely dependent upon Him for guidance and direction. He wants to be our inward uh, GPS system, if I can use that analogy. And how does that happen? Well, the Bible tells us that when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, His Holy Spirit comes and dwells within us. His Spirit takes up residence within us. You know, I remember uh, early on in my Christian life that I would come to passages of the Scripture and I'd look at it and, and they didn't make a lot of sense. And then I'd say, Lord, would you teach me with your Holy Spirit? Because help me to understand your word. And that's exactly what happened. But it's not because I'm special or different than you. No, that's available to all of us. The Holy Spirit is God's presence living within us to guide us and to help us understand his word. Let me read you from John 14, verse 26. Because you see, Scripture cannot be understood without hearing from the Holy Spirit. We have to hear and listen for the Holy Spirit. So God says, the counselor, this is Jesus talking to his disciples, 
the counselor of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Now, that's utterly fantastic. You see, we need the Holy Spirit to teach us the Word of God. I had the privilege of going to college and then the seminary, invested about 10 years in studying God's Word just with teachers and uh, educators. And while I love that learning experience, it was only knowledge. We were taught methods of studying the Bible and understanding the historical context, but without the Holy Spirit, God's Word was lifeless. But when I'm reading the Scripture and, and I come to it and I say, you know, Lord, teach me from your Word. It's like He has a Word for me for today. And it's almost like, boom, the light goes on. And I find that over and over again. Sometimes I have to speak to a group of people several times through the week, and I'll be reading in the Scripture. I say, God, will you just speak first of all to me so that I can have something to share with other people? And I can be going through the Scriptures, and all of a sudden, it just comes alive. You see, that's the Holy Spirit. And you can ha have the Holy Spirit in your life if you ask Jesus to be your Savior. And if you've already asked him to be your Savior and Lord, then what you simply need to do is just surrender each day and say, Lord, would you live through me and love through me? I want your Spirit to have full control. You know, if we're using the analogy of the GPS, it's like, now, Lord, I'm going to move out of the, the steering wheel area and you take the driver's seat. I'm going to be the co-pilot, you be the pilot. I love what the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Are you ready to listen? It says, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. That's the Holy Spirit. And why we received it? Well, Paul writes that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we may impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The Holy Spirit makes God's Word come alive so that I can make sense of situations. And so there is a need to be dependent on the Holy Spirit so that I can hear what He is saying to me in Scripture. So if I'm not reading God's Word, how is the Holy Spirit going to be able to apply it to me. It's one thing to study the Bible to gain knowledge, but it's another thing, to, as James says, don't just be hearers of God's Word, but be a doer. And that's what I want to invite you to do today, to pray with me right now and say, Father, would you just fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I can do what you want me to do and that I can understand your Word? He'll hear your prayer and he'll guide you regardless of what you're walking through, even if it's a valley of grief. He wants to speak that hope and truth into your heart today.